Okay, hi. Welcome back. Uh, It's great to be back. I apologize for two things. First of all, for missing last week. I was um, on retreat at a very wonderful monastery. And uh, I also blew it with the music. I I know it went dead for about five minutes there before the show, but I always find something new to mess up on these shows. So anyway, uh, thanks for coming. And uh, thanks for your excitement about Colby. And um, I'm going to, well, I always jump around, but I'll be jumping around a little bit today because there are a couple of really wonderful things about Colby that are interwoven. Uh, First of all is his incredible sanctity, um, which, of course, is going to be the main point of the show. Uh, Also, his he's about the most Marian saint that I know of with the possible... um, you know, contender with Louis de Montfort, but Colby's theology is definitely uniquely intensely Marian, and I'll be talking about that. Uh, He has a consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary that probably even outdoes Louis de Montfort's. And the other thing is that Colby um, was very militant in his nature, and he was fighting uh, the, the period leading up to World War II, um, the, was very dominated by a Masonic conspiracy against the Church, which gives me an opportunity to talk about the Masonic conspiracy against the Church then, and what it was uh, planning to accomplish, and where we are now, and in what way the two might be related. So all of those things are going to be somewhat inter- intertwined in today's show. Oh, and the final reason that why I, I really do have several particular, uh, particularly intense devotions to St. Maximilian Kolbe. One, of course, is because of the Auschwitz and Jewish connection, which the Jewish connection I may not have a chance to talk much about on the show, but he was very uh, passionate about the conversion of the Jews, and he had a tremendous heart for the Jews. As a matter of fact, I'll start with this. Um, he actually opened up the Nyepokalanov Monastery to shelter Jews at, when the Nazis had um, invaded Poland. And uh, some of his friars, uh, some people kind of objected and said, we don't have enough food for ourselves and for the Catholics here. Is it really right to be sharing it with the Jews? And uh, he came down like a ton of bricks on them. So, uh, but that isn't really what I want to say. What I really want to say was, y- you know, you, you don't know how to be a Catholic and you don't know how to kind of work on your way to getting to heaven if you don't use the example of the saints. That's what they're there for, sort of. Um, that's how one comes to an understanding of what transformation in Christ really consists of and how one goes about it, right? You look at experts who have succeeded to know how to do something. You want to know how to, you know, fix a leaky faucet or something. Um, you get advice from a plumber who really knows very well how to fix leaky prop faucets and so forth. And, um, you know, there's, by definition, it's the saints who know 
how to increase in sanctity and become ever more pleasing to God. However, it's a little bit hard to feel one's way into St. Lawrence, let's say, you know, who, who was uh, grilled to death on the, on the griddle and said to his tormentors, turn me over, this side is done now. I mean, it's a very beautiful story and, and true, of course, but I can't imagine what it would mean to try to put on that kind of sanctity. Even Joan of Arc. I mean, th these people lived in very different times, had very different sensibilities, and their persecutions had a very different form. St. Maximilian and Colby is really terrific for that because we're talking about, well, now I guess it's about 75 years ago, but essentially we're talking about our age. I mean, my parents, some of you may know, I mean, my parents were um, Holocaust refugees. You know, this is not ancient Rome. This is in the Middle Ages. And, and the kind of persecution that Maximilian Kolbe suffered at the hands of the Nazis is the kind of persecution that could still befall us now. I mean, it's, it's 20th century, 21st century kind of bureaucratic oppression, right? And hatred of the faith and this kind of turning down the thumb screws you know, clamping down more and more on um, human freedom and trying to make us into automatons. I forgot my mask today, speaking of that. But anyway, so you know where I'm, I'm coming from. Um, so, but one can always hold the model of uh, St. Dieter Stein or Maximilian Kolbe and their patience and their forbearance and their charity towards their persecutors in Auschwitz or under the Nazi regime when they were simply being um, getting more and more of their their freedoms and liberties taken away. And one can look at that and one can kind of compare it, so to speak, to some of the things that we're suffering or we might suffer and use it as a kind of appropriate model. So I hope I haven't gone too far astray, but I find it really useful because, for instance, um, I'm trying to think of an example, but, you know, when you're being subjected to this incredibly unfair, arbitrary, unreasoning kind of bureaucratic pressure, you know, whether it is, you know, from a policeman, which hasn't happened to me, or whether it's from a in a government office, you know, which has, where, where people are just making no sense and being unreasonably demanding for something that, you know, serves no purpose at all you know, just to kind of torment you or just to um, assert their power, that you can compare <laughs> to what Maximilian Kolbe faced or what, what St. Dieter Stein faced. You know, one of her early torments, St. Dieter Stein, was when the Nazis invaded Holland and the town she was in, she had to spend days waiting in lines, pointless lines. She'd be waiting in line for six hours to fill out a form and submit the form and be told that, oh, that was the wrong desk. She had to go to another desk and wait another four hours in a line to submit the form there. That kind of, that kind of torture, it's not really torture, but you know what I mean. Um, so these, these contemporary saints are particularly useful. And I, I will jump to the, to, to the kind of um, jump way ahead right now. St. Maximilian Kolbe, when he was in Auschwitz, being horribly tormented and tor literally tortured, and you know he was essentially tortured to death, so to speak, in the starvation bunker, he did nothing but pray for the salvation of his tormentors. And he, he, he kept preaching to everybody around him at Auschwitz that we must pray for their salvation, for the conversion of the Nazis. So, you know, talk about walking the walk. Uh, anyway, so on to, <laughs> on to the show. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to give short shrift to the biography. I think most of you may know the biography. And if I, I did a, a full job on the biography, that would use up the whole, you know, three hour show or whatever. So um, I'll, I'll race through it. But anyway, he was born in 1894. You need a kind of a, a little bit of a framework of, 
of the time that uh, he lived. Um, and he died, uh, I'll get to that, but I think it was 1941, 1942. So he lived till about 46, 47. He was born in a very small village in Poland um, called Zdunska Wola. And uh, he was one of three surviving sons, an extremely pious, devout family, wonderful mother and father, uh, quite poor, uh, sort of um, subsistence, um, on the one hand, subsistence farmers, and on the other hand, uh, they were weavers. I shouldn't say they were subsistence farmers. Their main profession was weavers. They, of course, grew a, a certain amount of their own food as much as they could. They also, for a while, ran a little like grocery store out of their house to supplement their income. They were always poor. And in fact, um, they were always giving away what little they had. Uh, in, th in fact, the little store they had went bankrupt because when people were too poor to pay, they didn't have to pay. And some people took advantage of them. Uh, let me show some uh, pictures. Here's a picture of their uh, hometown, Zdunskovola. Um, around the turn of the century. Um, so just give a little, a little local, local flavor. And here's a picture of the church in town where I would presume that uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe got baptized. And um, here's a picture of uh, St. Maximilian, Maximilian Kolbe's mother. I think you can see her um, sweetness and seriousness. As a matter of fact, her eyes to me look a lot like, uh, like Colby's eyes, uh, that kind of deep recollection and seriousness. I don't have a picture of, um, of the father, but um, religion was definitely the center of their lives. Uh, they had a little shrine in their house, as most people did, where they said the rosary together every evening, a little shrine to the Blessed Virgin Mary, of course. Um, and uh, they were very proud of being Polish. Poland had a very proud history, even though for most of that period of the uh, 18th, 19th century it was under foreign domination by various countries, by, um, I have that here, uh, Russia, Austria, and uh, Prussia. But it had a very proud history, including having saved Europe from Islam, from, from the Muslims, it's really true. And, and they were still very proud of that. Um, it was a very... I mean, it's really true. You know how the Irish are proud of having evangelized Europe, having sent out missionaries and and uh, being largely responsible for the conversion to Catholicism or to Christianity of Europe? Well, the Poles are very proud of having um, come to the rescue and saved Europe from Muslim domination. And that happened in uh, 1680, 1687, the Siege of Vienna. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. But anyway, so this was this like uh, Polish nationalism um, interwoven with Catholicism and a love of the faith. And that's what I really want to point out because Maximilian Kolbe, when he was growing up, you know, he dreamt of being a courageous soldier and, you know, freeing Poland from the foreign oppression and so forth and kind of restoring this nobility and, and uh, pride of the fatherland. And um, Maximilian Kolbe, his name was Raymond before he entered religion. So Raymond Kolbe's father was also a very um, proud and patriotic, but in a good way, not in a chauvinistic way, Pole. So, um, and uh, Raymond dreamt that one day Poland would be free again. I'm saying this because uh, Raymond, that's Maximilian Kolbe's, uh, militancy and desire to save Poland so kind of seamlessly was transformed into his uh, Catholicism, his missionary impulse, and his desire to save the church and to fight against the enemies of the church. So the militancy, which as a child expressed itself in this patriotism, uh, later in his life when he matured, expressed itself in his no holes barred uh, fighting for the Catholic Church. So anyway, I'll, uh, uh, I said I would, so I'll, I'll give a little digression about Poland saving um, Europe from the Muslims. One of the reasons for doing this, by the way, is there are so many echoes in the story of Maximilian Kolbe with 
what we're going through today. So anyway, it, it revolves around the siege of Vienna. Um, uh, Vienna was under siege by the Turks, which was really meant the Muslims. I mean, Turk, uh, Turkey was the, uh, basically was, was the caliphate. I mean, it was the, it was the, uh, center of the world of Islam, so to speak. So this business of, you know, the, the Turkish invasion, it's just like, you know, in the 18th century, they were called Turks and it was called the Turkish invasion, but, um, Turkey essentially was the entire um, Arab Muslim world. So anyway, so they're kind of synonymous. So here you have a picture of the siege of Vienna. You can see in the upper right-hand corner there, right kind of by the picture of me, the um, skyline of Vienna there in the distance. And you can see all of the fields and hills in front of Vienna being covered with the Turkish or Muslim troops. And um, here is uh, a scene of the Battle of Vienna. The, the, the Poles sent in their army or their division or whatever, and it lifted the siege of Vienna and thereby um, saved Vienna, which was the, basically the capital of Christendom, and saved um, this final uh, final. Um, battle to protect Europe from uh, um, being conquered by Islam. But this is really where I was going to, um, which was the, this is, um, this is a Polish king, Sobieski, who led the troops and lifted the siege. And as soon as he uh, was victorious, you see here, he's handing a document. That's the papal envoy that man in clerical clothes that the king on the horseback is handing the document to because i mean he was he was fighting for christendom he was fighting for the catholic church against the enemies of the catholic church and when he won the battle you can see that little rainbow in the background right that's the sign of god's god's pleasure or god's uh, shining on it um let me see if i can actually put myself up there uh, uh, okay, just for fun there. Um, he, um, his message to the Pope was, I came, I saw God conquered. And uh, on his way to the battle, he stopped at the shrine of Our Lady of Chestahova, which is the central Marian shrine of uh, Poland. And um, let me uh, pull up a, a picture of the Black Madonna there, which um, is the icon of the shrine. And he, um, she's actually officially the Queen of Poland. Um, and she's credited with having saved Poland in the face of a Protestant invasion in the 17th century by the Swedes. And um, after that battle was turned through the intercession of Our Lady of Czestochowa, the Polish king at the time, who was King uh, John Casimir Vasa, proclaimed Our Lady of Czestochowa the Queen of Poland, which she has been ever since. So, okay, that's my little, my little um, kind of a history digression, so to speak. But what I wanted to do was I wanted to kind of lay a little backdrop of how intensely uh, Catholic Poland still is to a large extent, by the way. Uh, it was preserved, in a way, communism preserved it from the uh, 20th century drift towards materialism. So when it was liberated from communism, it was still very in intensely uh, Catholic. And so I, I just wanted to, you can't understand Maximilian, Colby, unless you can see the flowing together of uh, Polish nationalism and Polish pride and Polish self-identity with Catholic self-identity and fighting for the church. So back to Maximilian Colby. So here's a picture of him. I was very happy to find when he's, I would imagine, about 12. Uh, it shows his um, kind of intensity and in some sense recollection 
I suspect that this picture was taken after his central conversion experience. By the way, just, just for fun, let me flip back and forth between that and his mother because I think that you can see, I mean, I think he resembles his mother and I think the eyes are very much the same. By the way, I'm jumping forward, but after the three sons, because um, remember it was the mother and the father and only three sons who survived, uh, Maximilian was the middle son, if I remember correctly. They were quite close together. I think they were about two or three years apart um, between them. And when they all had become Franciscans, both parents separated and both became religious. And uh, the mother uh, became a, joined a Benedictine convent in, um, I believe, in Lvov. And the father joined a Franciscan monastery in, I believe, Warsaw. I have that um, in my notes. I can, I can do a better job when I get to that part of my notes. Okay, so... The, the okay, Maximilian Kolbe, I'll, I'll bring up that kid again, um, was a rambunctious, strong-willed in some sense, fun-loving, uh, very active little boy. He was always getting in trouble. He always accepted his punishment uh, cheerfully uh, with resignation. In other words, he knew he deserved it. He never rebelled against being punished for his misdeeds. He always recognized them. But he was not a, uh, you know, he was a little of a Dennis the Menace. And at one point, his mother, when he was 12, he was getting, Raymond, as his name was at the time, was getting into the usual trouble. And his mother said to him in exasperation, Raymond, what's ever going to become of you? And uh, this had a very sobering effect on him. He immediately went to the little shrine in the corner of their house, which there's a shrine to the Blessed Virgin Mary to talk to her and then he went to the parish church and he knelt down before the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the parish church and he had this uh, seminal conversion experience which he described later in the following way he said quote um, well he went to the statue of Mary the Blessed Virgin Mary in the parish church and asked her mother of God what is going to become of me? That's what his mother had said to her, Raymond, what's going to become of you? And then, this is his direct words, she came to me holding two crowns, one white and one red. She asked me if I was willing to accept either of these crowns. The white one meant that I should persevere in purity, and the red, that I should become a martyr. I choose both of them, he said, and she smiled and disappeared. So let me see if I have other pictures. Um, hmm. Oh, I never had the pictures I want of uh, other images. That image of the Blessed Virgin Mary appearing to him with two crowns. In that picture, for some reason, it's only the white crown. So I, I uh, apologize for that. Is really, um, is really the central icon for Maximilian Kolbe, that and the one of him in Auschwitz. So that is when he volunteered, volunteered to become a celibate religious and volunteered to become a martyr. Okay, so um, now I'm just going to race through, uh, you know, about 15 years of his biography. So anyway, that was when he was 12. Um, and then, um, uh, when, about the next year, a Franciscan priest came to his parish to give a mission, a parish mission, and um, he announced that he was going to open a pre-seminary, essentially, a minor seminary school in Lvov, and they were looking for candidates and uh, young men to dedicate themselves to the service of God uh, through consecration to Mary. And uh, Raymond, that's Maximilian, of course, um, enthusiastically gave his name along with his older brother, uh, whose name was Francis, gave their names, got their parents' permission to go to this uh, school. And they got accepted in the school. And they were excellent students, and especially Raymond. And after three years there, so now he's about 15, 16, I guess, 
um, he had, it was time to either leave or enter the novitiate, the Franciscan novitiate, and he was going to leave. He had determined that he was, you know, not going to become a novice, that it wasn't for him. And he was actually on his way to the superior's office in order to resign when he got the call to go to the parlor because his mother was there. And when he sees his mother in the parlor, she's waiting for them, glowing, to give them the happy news that their youngest brother, Joseph, was also going to join the Franciscans. And that freed up the parents to become religious, and so she was going to join the Benedictines. And his father was going to join the Franciscans. Isn't this wonderful? All five of them were going to be religious. Well, uh, of course, um, Raymond or Maximilian uh, took the hint and immediately signed up for the novitiate rather than resigning. So that's how he joined the novitiate. And um, he, of course, was very intelligent. And the, his superiors decided to send him to Rome. And so in, um, in uh, okay, so when he was 16, that's 1910, he joined the novitiate. Um, a year later, he took his first vows. Uh, a year later, he was sent to Rome to get degrees in philosophy and theology. And in 1915, so that would be when he was 21, which would be very young for that, he received a doctorate, summa cum laude, that's the highest possible grade, uh, in philosophy from the Gregorian, which is one of the pontifical institutes in Rome. And a few years later, he got a doctorate in theology also from the uh, Franciscan University, the Seraphic College in Rome. And um, in, uh, in 1918, which was a year earlier when he was 24, uh, do I have that right? Yes, 24, he was ordained a priest, which brings us back to Alphonse Radisbone. Because if you saw that show, you may remember that Alphonse Radisbone's miraculous conversion took place through an apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary at a church called San Andrea della Frata in Rome. And the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to um, St. Alphonse Radisbone over the altar. He was an um, atheist, atheist Jew, anti-Catholic Jew, I might add. Um, and she appeared to him over the altar to St. Michael in those days. Um, and um, she just appeared to him silently, appearing as she does on the Miraculous Medal with her arms outstretched. And uh, he saw the rays flowing down from her fingers. And uh, he was just instant conversion. The truths of the faith were infused into him. He saw his sin. He saw the horribleness of original sin. Um, he just saw, I don't I'm trying to say he saw everything. Fell to his knees, weeping, unable to speak. And the first thing he said essentially was, take me to a priest, I want to be baptized. Now, this is where that took place. This is the altar to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now it's an altar to the, to the uh, Madonna of the Miracle. That's the picture there. At the time, it was an altar to um, St. Michael the Archangel. Um, this is, by the way, the church from the outside, just to be complete there. It's actually not one of the more um, you know, extraordinarily elaborate churches in Rome. Anyway, that is the altar where it happened. Uh, and if you see, look carefully, you'll see there are two busts framing the altar. On the left is a bust of Alphonse Radisbone, and on the right is a bust of, who is that? Maybe I can zoom in, so to speak. Who is that? That is a bust of, in fact, our friend Maximilian Kolbe, because it was at that altar that he chose to celebrate his first Mass. Now, um, why did he choose that altar to celebrate his first Mass? several reasons. One is he was very, very moved by the conversion of Alphonse Radisbone, but he also took that as a model of, of all conversions to come, so to speak. Um, that Alphonse Radisbone was converted through the um, Miraculous Medal. Now, the image on the Miraculous Medal is in fact of the, let me pull up the, the metal here, 
Um, the words around the miraculous metal are, O Mary conceived without sin, in other words, the immaculate conception. The miraculous medal is actually a medal to the mirac to the immaculate conception. It's celebrating the immaculate conception. It's celebrating the Blessed Virgin Mary in her title as the Immaculata. Now, the Blessed Virgin Mary's self-identification as the Immaculata, you know, you all know the story, when she appeared to Bernadette in Lourdes and Bernadette asked her, who are you? Her Bernadette's parish priest had told Bernadette to ask the beautiful lady who she was. Um, the Blessed Virgin Mary's response was, I am the Immaculate Conception. That phrase, I am the Immaculate Conception, was absolutely the center of Maximilian Kolbe's obsession, let me say, in a positive sense. His total focus on the Blessed Virgin Mary for all of his life was around her self-identification as the Immaculate Conception. And uh, Bernadette herself said that when the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to her in Lourdes, she looked very much like she does on the Miraculous Medal, that is with her arms downward and outstretched with rays flowing. I don't know if Bernadette said with rays flowing down. I don't think she said that. But with her arms outstretched like that and her fingers outstretched like that. So Maximilian Kolbe's central icon or image of the Blessed Virgin Mary was how she looked when she said, I am the Immaculate Conception, which is the image on the Miraculous Medal, which is precisely the image which um, uh, the way that she appeared to Alphonse Radisbone. And there you see the, the image of her as she appeared to Alphonse Radisbone over the altar. And um, here you have like a zooming in, so to speak, on that image. And it's exactly the image from the Miraculous Medal. And Maximilian Kolbe, for the rest of his life, ran around uh, basically giving people <laughs> the Miraculous Medal. For, I, I mean, in other words, it was a, a central... He called them the silver bullets, and he gave them away at every opportunity to everyone he met who needed conversion, especially anti-Catholics, by the way, Masons and, and atheists and people hostile to the faith, with confidence that as the Blessed Virgin Mary was able to convert the hard-headed, stubborn, anti-Catholic Jew Alphonse Radisbone, she would be able to convert the people he gave the Miraculous Medal to. So that is why he chose to have his first Mass at, um, the, uh, at that altar. And um, I'm going to give, I, I'm, just because I have this picture, I'm just going to give a little personal digression. I went to Rome. It was one of the central events in my life. I, I think it was 1998 uh, for the canonization of St. Dieter Stein. Uh, I was a new Catholic then. I think I had been baptized about three or four years. And um, it was a celebration, of course, of the continuity between Judaism and the Catholic Church to have this Jewish woman, Eder Stein, uh, canonized. And um, us Jewish Catholics had a mass. Providence arranged this. But um, Providence arranged for us to get together and have our own little mass at that altar, at that very altar above which the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to Radisbone, and that very altar where St. Um, Maximilian Kolbe celebrated his first Mass. And, um, and I got to do the first reading, and I had my talus with me. So there I am at that altar in San Andrea della Frata, uh, the day before, I believe it was the day before uh, Ederstein's canonization, doing the first reading, wearing my talus. Uh, I think you can see there the date on the on the photograph, uh, October 10th, 1998. So anyway, a very, a huge altar in, in the history of both uh, Maximilian Kolbe and the conversion of the Jews. Okay, back to the main storyline. Um, okay, so that's where he celebrated his first Mass. That's where I was before I got um, uh, a little bit digressed. And then the following year, he returned to Poland. And I'll get to that. 
However, let me stay in Rome for the moment. While he is doing his graduate studies in Rome, we're talking about 1917, 1918, 1919. It was this height of this Masonic invasion, let's say, of Rome, uh, this, this surge of Masonic activity in Rome. And in fact, in 1917, the Masons were celebrating their bicentenary, their, their 200 year anniversary of their presence in Italy or in Rome, I should say, probably. And they had a huge march and they marched on the Vatican. And um, uh, let me read what they, uh, oh, they marched with a slogan, Satan and carrying banners with the slogan, Satan must reign in the Vatican. The Pope will be his slave. Okay. Now, this is my like first major digression of the show. <sighs> there are two armies in the world. There are only two forces in the world, really. There are only two, two genuine ant uh, antagonists in the world. Two, two competing armies. There is the army of God, not Hezbollah, which means army of God, which refers to the other army, actually, the one who pretends to be God and wanted to be God and was thrown out of heaven because he wasn't God, but the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, the forces of Christ, let's say. On the one side, you have the forces of Christ and the, the um, home base, the, the um, I'm not very eloquent today, the headquarters of the forces of Christ are the Catholic Church. On one side, you have the forces of Christ, and on the other side, you have the forces of the Antichrist. Now, the forces of the Antichrist don't have one headquarters because that's in the nature of, of Satan, right? Christ is unity and cooperation and mutual love. Satan is, you know, competition, conflict, chaos. So, you know, all of the demons are obedient to Satan, but they're also all fighting each other. They're all competing. You know, it's, it's, it's a very chaotic, contentious kind of environment. So there isn't like one holy unified front for the enemy. There's one holy unified front, at least headquarters of that front, for Christ, which is the Catholic Church. But on the enemy's side, you have you know, a bunch of like, they're all under one general, ultimately, which is Satan, but they all have their commanders, you know, it's like warlords, you know, it's like, it's actually like, what you, <laughs> I hate to say it, of what you have in the Islamic world, where um, in a way, they're all, I mean, you can think of ISIS and Al Qaeda, and um, I don't even remember all the other names, Hamas and Hezbollah, all of these Islamic armies, because that's what they are, they're all like fighting for Islam and they're all fighting against Christianity, but they're also all fighting each other. That's one of the problems Israel has, which is that, you know, Israel is supposed to make peace with Hezbollah and Hamas, Hamas and the PLO. But you can't actually make peace with the three of them because they're actually at war with each other. And a lot of the conflict in the Gaza Strip and a lot of the conflict in the occupied territories at various points of time are actually wars between competing warlords of Hamas versus the PLO in the occupied territories in the West Bank and um, Hamas, I don't, I don't have the, Hamas versus Hezbollah, I believe, in the Gaza Strip. I may have that not entirely right. Um, and I believe in, anyway, I, I'm not going to fake it, but you get my point is that there are those three of them. And then elsewhere in the Middle East, you have Al Qaeda fighting, um, Hezbollah or whatever, or, you know, these various things. So that's really the, what the, what the devil's army is like. Um, so, so, and this is a great mystery that it's really important to understand, to understand the world today. So who are the people fighting the Catholic church? who are in a sense allies because they're all the army of Satan. Well, they are, um, they are the Masons, they are the communists, 
they are the um, libertines, you know, the, the, the people fighting for abortion and contraception and fornication, uh, fighting against marriage, in fact, and the sanctity of marriage, uh, fighting against a gender, gen genuine gender identity. In other words, you know, there aren't two genders, you know, you are whatever you want to be. There are all of these different, they're all fighting in the same army in a sense, in the sense that they're all under Satan eventually, and they're all opposed to the Catholic Church. But by nature, they're also all fighting each other. They only unite in order to fight against Christ. So, and this is why, you know, you have like the Masonic, you see, one of the problems with conspiracy theories is, you know, are the Jews really united with the Masons and really united with the communists and really united with Planned Parenthood and really united with, um, uh, you know, with the, the Muslims? Um, you know, the answer is no. And of course, the Muslims, I mean, right now in the United States, you have the, the um, Muslim political forces very much aligned with Planned Parenthood and very much aligned with um, LBGBTQ, whatever that is, you know, the, 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 the gay lobby. And they're all patting each other on the back and they're all, they're all in bed with each other in the Democratic Party. Yet homosexuality is a capital crime in Muslim countries and in the Koran, right? So it's absolutely absurd that they should be allies, but they're allies because they're all in the army of Satan. Okay, so why am I saying this? In the course of this show, I am going to be talking about the Masonic conspiracy against the church and the communist conspiracy against the church. And they are interwoven. That doesn't mean uh, that I'm convinced that the Masons are talking to the communists. Um, they're, they're just reporting to the same eventual five-star general, which is Satan, and he is coordinating their activities. And I think that's the only way you can under understand the grand conspiracy against the Catholic Church is that the ultimate agent of coordination is Satan. And all of these different wings, which appear to be working together, they are working together indirectly through Satan, but they're not working together in the sense that they have Zoom meetings and the head of the Communist Party is talking with the head of the Masons, who's talking with the head of the Union of Orthodox Rabbis or whatever, and the head of the LGBTQ, you know, whatever it is, organization, and, you know, the Grand Mufti. They're not all together on a Zoom call coordinating their efforts. They may all hate each other, but their efforts are being coordinated on a higher level, which is on a lower level, which is demonic, okay? And now I'm saying this for a number of reasons. One is, I don't believe in the Jewish Masonic uh, communist conspiracy to destroy the church in the sense of a human conspiracy. I don't. Um, and, and if you're, you know, I don't know how exposed you've been to those, you know, kind of ultra right-wing, sometimes traditionalist Catholic circles who believe that the Jews are actually in bed with the Masons and the Communists trying to destroy the Catholic Church. I don't think that's true. I just think that the devil is using um, Jews and a Jewish uh, antipathy towards the Catholic Church as a means of attacking the Catholic Church. You see this in, for instance, in um, the ACLU. Um, I mean, there's no question. I mean, I know this even growing up. I mean, look, from a Jewish perspective, um, you don't really want the United States to be a Christian country, an overtly Christian country, you know, because then you're kind of a second class citizen because you're not Christian. So you want it to be a secular country. Yeah, you know, mea culpa. It's kind of logical. It's not a hatred of the Catholic Church. It's not a desire to destroy the Catholic Church or Christianity, but it is in some sense, being an agent to oppose the overtly Christian identity of, of the United States or of other countries. And then you have um, the, the Masons who are founded 
with an absolute explicit intention to destroy the Catholic Church. So they are obviously in that army. And you have the communists who see the Catholic Church as the uh, primary impediment to their takeover of the world and uh, their basically negation of human individuality and individual rights and individual freedom and so forth. And then, of course, you see Islam and you see Christianity and the Catholic Church as the most cohesive force opposing the um, erosion of the resistance of the imposition of Islam, let me say. Let me put it that way. So that's why these guys are all together. Now, that fight against the Catholic Church has been going on for hundreds of years. Um, it's certainly been going on. Uh, I mean, I, you can just start with the Fr French Revolution. You can start with the 17th century. I, it's been going on before then. But it's very evident from the French Revolution on this you know, Masonic conspiracy against the Catholic Church. The French Revolution was, in fact, uh, birthed in a Masonic Revolution, as was the overthrow of Spain as the ruler of Latin America, Spain being a very overtly co uh, Catholic country, the overthrow of the Catholic government of Mexico, and finally, getting to this point, the overthrow of the Papal States. Uh, and that, I'm going to get to 1917, because um, until the mm, 1860s, I may be off by 10 years, um, the, the, the papacy, there were papal states in what is now Italy, that individual city-states, they were individual nations. Bologna was a nation, uh, Venice was a nation, Rome was a nation, Florence was a nation. Um, they were independent. There wasn't one Italy. All of these city-states, they sp spoke Italian, they had this common culture to a large extent, but they, had, they were their own kingdoms. They were kingdoms. And um, the papal, many of them were pa papal states, and they were under the Pope. And the Pope had this temporal kingdom known as the Papal States. That only fell in the second half of the 19th century, and it fell in what was called the Risorgimento, which was a Masonic-led, overtly Masonic-led. Yes, the Jews were supporting the Masonic-led revolution. Yes, because it was the emancipation of the Jews from their perspective. See, this is where, why, where you get this common cause. It doesn't mean that the Jews were Masons or even that the Jews were welcome. Uh, in the Masonic guilds, but it does mean that they, you know, you, the enemy of my enemy is my friend business. So anyway, it was the Masons who overthrew the, pap overthrew the Papal States. The Masons, uh, especially in Italy, you know, the, it, was, it was frontal war against the Pope. So that's why they were marching in 1917 with banners. Uh, oh, by the way, the Pope at the time was a prisoner in the Vatican. I forgot to mention that. But once the Papal States fell, the only, uh, when Rome fell to the Risorgimento, and all of the leaders of that, by the way, were Masons, explicitly Masons. Um, um, I'll get to them in a moment. Uh, the Pope was a prisoner in the Vatican because the only um, sovereign territory that the Catholic Church still held on to was, uh, was basically the Vatican. You know what the Vatican is. It's, I don't know what it is. It's maybe 100 acres or something. You know, it's in the center of Rome. It's got walls around it. I'm sure they were very happy to have walls around it at the time. But that the Pope was a prisoner in there for like decades because um, he would be arrested if he, you know, stepped into Rome, stepped outside of the, the protection of the Vatican. Um, and it was only under Mussolini, actually, I think it was called the Lateran Treaty, that the state of war, essentially, between Italy and the, pap the, the papacy was resolved with the Lateran Treaty. But anyway, so um, in 1917, when this march was going on, the Pope was a prisoner in the Vatican. And the, the march, these Masons were marching up to the doors of the Vatican, basically saying, uh, Satan must reign in the Vatican, the Pope will be his slave. Now, 
I have a picture of a Masonic march from those days. It's not the one in Rome. I couldn't find one. But um, it is a Masonic march. And you can see the immensity of the troops. You can see the way it looks like an army, right? That looks like a military march. You can see that they're marching in the shape of, I believe it's an upside-down cross, which is a satanic symbol. So this is what Maximilian Kolbe saw in Rome when he saw the Masonic march on the Vatican. Now, um, he re his response to this was to start the Militia Maculata. Um, I don't know how many of you are um, MIs, we call ourselves. Um, it is an organization that still traces itself, let's say, to uh, Maximum Colby's Militia Maculata. He started in Rome in uh, 1917 um, he, uh, with four or five or six confreres of his. Uh, he started it in a, um, in a apartment in Rome. I actually made a pilgrimage to that room in which he started the Militia Maculata. And he started it with this in mind. In other words, he wanted to start an army to fight against the army of the Antichrist, the army of the Masons, and so forth. And um, this is what he said at the time. He said, In the face of such attacks of the enemies of the Church of God, are we to remain inactive? No. Every one of us has a holy obligation to personally hurl back the assaults of the foe. Such implacable hatred for the church is of a systematic activity stemming in the final analysis from Freemasonry. In particular, it aims to destroy the Catholic religion through religious indifference and weakening of moral forces. According to the basic principle, we will conquer the Catholic church not by argumentation, but rather with moral corruption, with moral corruption. I may have to split this show into two because, because I, it may be a four hour show if I don't. Anyway, moral corruption. This is like so important to understand if you want to understand what's going on in the Catholic Church today and for the last 60 years. The Masons have been plotting for 300 years to destroy the Catholic Church. They have an overt plan for it. That overt plan is not by conquering through argumentation, not by military conquest, but by moral corruption. You know, you can see how we got to where we are now, and I'm going to talk about that in a few moments. Um, let me go back. I know you guys... Um, hey, another MI there. Um, yes, many Satanists wear such a cross, including... including um, Bill Gates' wife, Melinda Gates. You can find pictures of her on, on the internet uh, in an interview. I think it's in an interview where she's wearing an upside-down cross. <laughs> okay, really. We're in for it big time. Um, uh, by the way, um, oh, it's not so bad. Um, the, the chat stream is delayed, or rather my broadcast is actually delayed about a minute, so I see your comments. Uh, there's a little lag time. Um, Okay, so that's the Masonic March. I'll pull it up for a moment here. And let me jump to... Okay, just because I said it. Okay, so all of these, all of these um, uh, revolutionaries who destroyed the... Um, destroyed the sovereignty of the Catholic nations, I will say destroyed the Catholic governments in Latin America and in Europe. Um, they were Masons. And um, the Pope, as I said, um, I'm, I'm turning to the right page in my notes so I can do a better job with dates. The Pope was literally a prisoner in the Vatican from 1870 until 1929. Okay? The, um, the, uh, I talked in an earlier show, the one on Our Lady of Guadalupe, 
how the Catholic government of Mexico was um, overthrown by a violent, very anti-Catholic revolution that uh, uh, around 1910 to 1920, led by a Mason named uh, Cali, if I, if I remember correctly. Uh, you may know, remember uh, Saint Miguel Pro, the Christ Cristeros, all of the martyrs of the Mexican Revolution who were um, uh, canonized, I believe, by Pope John Paul II, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, the, um, all of South America was um, under Catholic Spain. And all of the countries that we know of now as South America, Venezuela, and Central America, I might add, Venezuela, Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Panama were liberated from Spain in a Masonic revolution led by, I, Masonic revolutions, plural, but all of them were led by um, uh, Simon Bolivar. Here is a picture of, oops, I don't know why this doesn't always work. Um, uh, let me find him again. Uh, boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Uh, Simon Bolivar, okay. Okay, actually, there. Uh, Simone Bolivar. And um, this is from a Masonic site, by the way. I'll read his biography. Brother Simon Bolivar is one of the most influential known Freemasons in the history of the world. Um, that's 1816 is the date on the picture. Um, he was, uh, okay, he was born in Venezuela. He was sent to Europe to be educated. He was exposed to the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. He was initiated into the Masons in the Lataro Lodge in Cadiz, Spain. And uh, there he met the Masonic brothers who, which, who would aid him in liberating Latin America from Spanish tyranny. In other words, just <laughs> destroying the, um, the Catholic rule of um, Central America. And he returned to South America in uh, 1804 and he began his illustrious career as a military hero. And um, he, uh, anyway, he, in 1821, he crushed the largest Spanish expeditionary force ever assembled um, at the Battle of Carabato, ending Spanish rule in South America. This is a Masonic site, so I'll read this. Thereby, he brought his long-cherished Masonic ideals of representative government and individual liberty to the people. Anyway, and he would serve as the president or influencer of all of Spanish-speaking South America until his death in 1830, and he received the 33rd degree of Freemasonry in 1824. Okay, and so that is how South and Central America um, were put under um, anti-Catholic governments. And then uh, it, uh, Italy, so to speak, um, the Risorgimento was led by uh, Garibaldi. By the way, these people are considered heroes, of course, by the uh, secular governments that they established. And of course, there, there's, uh, you know, piazzas named after Garibaldi and, and a country named after Bolivar, of course, Bolivia, and so forth. Um, they're not seen as bad guys, just like the French Revolution. You know, the, the French version of the 4th of July is Bastille Day, which is celebrating the the um, beginning of the French Revolution, essentially, and the guillotines and the slaughter of the clerics and the the uh, attempt to destroy Christianity in France, and that's their national holiday. So you know, high school textbooks are on the wrong side of this. But anyway, here's Garibaldi, who was the leading force behind the Risorgimento, which resulted in the unified Italy and resulted in the uh, Pope being a prisoner in the Vatican and the Papal States being um, dissolved as Papal States. And um, he was initiated in 1848 into the Lazami de la Patrie Lodge in Montevideo, Uruguay, as a Mason. 
um, and he remained an active Mason until his death in 1882. I'm reading from the Masonic site now. Often his Masonic brothers were his comrades in arms, and his Masonic ideals went with him everywhere that he raised the flag of liberation. Uh, remember that um, Lenin raised the flag of liberation, that um, in fact, you know, what, what was it called? The um, Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. They were raising the flag. Antifa is raising the flag of liberation. You know what kind of liberation that was in, in, uh, in Portland, right? Some liberation. That's the liberation that they're talking about. So anyway, that is um, where, the, <laughs> where Colby's impetus to fight against, to, to start an army to fight against what the Masons were doing, fighting against the church. Now, when Colby fought against the Masons, his way of fighting against the Masons is praying for their conversion. I mean, he argued with them very successfully when he had the opportunity, but he always prayed for their conversion. He always tried to give them miraculous medals. Um, his uh, prayer, he said every day, I'm not going to remember this word for word. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us, have recourse to thee. That's from the miraculous medal. And for those, of, for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially the Freemasons, the Jews, and the enemies of your church. And he always insisted um, on praying for the persecutors of the church. And he was always convinced that the Blessed Virgin Mary, if she was given the slightest little toehold, would be able to convert even the most vicious enemy of the church, which is why he tried to get them to accept a miraculous medal, because of course it was Alphonse Radisbone accepting the miraculous medal, which led to his conversion. So St. Maximilian Kolbe was using the conversion of Alphonse Radisbone as the prototype for how all of the enemies of the church would be converted. Okay, makes sense, I hope. Now, let me jump to the present day, so to speak. Um, okay, okay, Chaz was in Seattle. Yes, I'm sorry, I keep mix, I always mix up Minneapolis, Seattle, and Portland since they're kind of these three hot spots of, of what's going on. Uh, mea culpa. Thank you. Actually, I mix up everything. <laughs> sorry, I'm a broad brush kind of guy, but sometimes the brush is too broad. Okay, now. Back to this Masonic Communist alliance to destroy the church. First of all, this I'm going to read you a quote from um, a Masonic, I don't want to call it Bible, but it was the permanent instruction of the Alta Vendita Lodge. So these were instructions by Masons to Masons about this long-term plan to destroy the church. Let me make my last digression for the moment. How can you have a 300, 400 year conspiracy? This used to really bother me. I used to, I used to dismiss the concept of a 300 year conspiracy theory. You know, a conspiracy that was going to span 300 years because I could see how I might work fervently for something that might only come about 30 years later, you know, in my old age or something. Or maybe work fervently for something which would only come about 60 years later, you know, in my children's maturity. But how could I pour my heart and soul into working for something, the fruits of which would only be seen 300 years later, right? No one's going to do that, right? So that's why I rejected the idea of a, like a 300-year Masonic conspiracy to destroy the church. But I was missing something really critical that only came to me recently, which is this: these conspiracies are taking place on two levels. Satan is perfectly happy to wait 300 years. He can wait 600 years. He can wait 10,000 years. He doesn't have 10,000 years, thank God, but you know what I mean. Because, of course, he lives forever, and he's no older 300 years from now, and, you know, he's got a real long-term horizon. So, of course, Satan doesn't mind hatching a plot in the year 1600, which will only reach fruition in 1964, let's say. 
uh, picking a, a year out of the air. He doesn't mind, right? He, I mean, 350 years is like 35 days to us for him. But what about his human collaborators? Well, they don't have to wait 350 years because they're paid with cash on the barrel head. They're paid on the spot, right? All of Satan's human cooperators are paid immediately, not only in their lifetimes, but that very day, right? Look at, again, look at Bill Gates, look at George Soros, look at uh, David Koresh, look at Mohammed, look at, you know, um, whoever. I'm drawing a blank. Look at Charlie Manson, okay? They are paid by Satan's coin of the coin, this coin of Satan's realm, right? They're paid by what they want the most. They're paid by the by lust. Rasputin, supposedly, um, and not supposedly by accurate accounts, had women lined up in the snow outside of his hut in the winter in Russia, waiting to be used by him, I'll just say as sexual objects, you guys know what I mean, through the night, you know, having a dozen partners. And he had the faculty to have a dozen partners in one night. Mohammed boasted that, um, that he could have relations with all, I think it was 12 of his wives in one night, okay? So if what you want is the exercise of lust, Satan pays that on the spot if you're a servant of his. If you want money, he pays that on the spot. I mean, look at George Soros. Look at, look at Bill Gates. Look at, God forbid, John Paulson. That's a little in-joke. <laughs> Maybe I'll, if any of you know who John Paulson is, um, uh, a former friend of mine, um, who uh, actually made hundreds of millions of dollars, now billions of dollars, um, off of the uh, housing collapse. Um, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, all of the servants, I mean, all the Masons, um, you know, who really are, are doing a good job for Satan, they, they, you know, they're getting paid. Here's another personal story. Uh, this is a friend of mine. So this is like a, a thousand percent true. I'm not going to give any identifying information. But he was from an intensely Masonic family. He's a good Catholic. He's got nothing to do with the Masons. He fights the Masons. But when he was a child, he actually witnessed his older sister, who I believe was eight at the time, um, disappearing into basically being used for ritual sexual abuse by his, by her grandfather and her father at the same time, I mean, sequentially, but, you know, the, uh, in the same session, okay? Now, I don't know what kind of perverse lust results in A, lusting after an eight-year-old, and B, one who's your daughter or your granddaughter, but this was Satan's paying, right? Paying these people with, with what they wanted. They didn't have to wait 350 years to get their payment. So, uh, Charles Manson, similarly, you know, had incredible ability to indulge in lust. I'll just leave it at that. As did Rasputin, as did David Koresh, who, who was the Branch Davidian uh, cult leader. James Jones, remember that? Uh, jo uh, Jonestown. So, you know, if it's lust you want, Satan pays cash on the barrel head. If it's money you want, Satan pays cash on the barrel head. And then he has other servants, you know, the next generation, the next generation, the next generation. So that's the secret of how you can have a 300-year conspiracy. Satan is patient, and the human collaborators don't have to be patient because they're getting rewarded in their lifetime in that very year. So there you go. Everything fell into place once I realized that. So now... Back to this book that um, uh, actually it pre it's, the account of this book is from, from 1885. So the book itself, the Masonic Lodge book, must be from before then. And that Masonic Lodge book is the permanent instruction of the Alta Vendita Lodge. And this is what it said. Our ultimate end is that of the French Revolution. 
the final destruction forever of Catholicism and even of the Christian idea. What we must ask for, what we should look for and wait for, is a Pope according to our needs. Now then, to assure ourselves of a Pope of the required dimensions, it is a question first of shaping for this Pope a generation worthy of the reign we are dreaming of. So before they get the Pope they want, they have to prepare the ground by establishing a generation in the church that will be fertile ground for this pope that they're aiming at. And then on back to the um, Masonic instruction. And this pontiff, like most of his contemporaries, will be necessarily more or less imbued with the humanitarian principles that we are going to begin to put into circulation. The humanitarian principles being, um, you know, the original slogan of um, Margaret Sanger's Birth Control League was no gods, no masters. You know, and the French Revolution was liberty, fraternity, equality. But the basic thrust is that the dignity of man requires but that he be subject to no authority, including an external moral authority such as that imposed by God or the church. And that is the humanitarian principle that, the, that has to be inserted into the, the culture, into the civilization, to enable this Masonic revolution against the church. So be careful when you see the phrase humanitarianism, <laughs> because, of course, there's something very wonderful. I mean, I mean... Nobody cares about their fellow man like the Catholic Church, like Christ, right, who died on the cross, or like Maximilian Kolbe, who died for a stranger, not only died, but was horribly tortured for a stranger, right? So no one can claim that Maximilian Kolbe doesn't care about his fellow man. But it's not humanitarianism in the sense of um, the, the Masonic thrust behind humanitarianism. Now, we are seeing humanitarianism rear its ugly head in, um, let's say, the voice of the church. So that's why I wanted to raise that red flag. <clears throat> now, the Masonic communist conspiracy, or, or rather, let me put it another way. The Masons are determined to destroy the church. The communists are determined to destroy the church. They're working hand in glove, even if their coordination is not being done on a human level. It might be being done on a human level. I'm not convinced of that, but it's certainly being done if, you know, on one level or another. I'm going to tell the story of Bella Dodd. I, and I love these chat streams. So, so you guys out there, you know, chat in if you know who Bella Dodd is. Now, I know the story of Bella Dodd is true because I know it from uh, an eyewitness, okay? because I had the great gift in my conversion of being good friends with Alice von Hildebrand. I don't know if any of you know who Alice von Hildebrand is, but um, her husband was, oops, that's not the slide I wanted. Um, her husband was Dietrich von Hildebrand, who uh, Pope Benedict called uh, 20th century doctor of the church. And I'm very close to Alice von Hildebrand. I just saw her literally last week. She's, I think, 90 uh 98 now anyway she might be 97 um and she was friends with bella dodd so she got this from bella dodd herself and i got it from alice von hildebrand herself so this is uh this is bella dodd and um bella dodd let me tell the story i have to tell the story of bella dodd and then i'm going to give a bit of her testimony that's bella dodd you get to see bella dodd yes I see that Katie knows about it. Um, uh, but anyway, let me get me back up for the moment. Oh, God bless Dr. Alice. How is her health? Um, I hope I'm like that when I'm like 97 or 98. I think her health is her biggest cross because she really wants to be released from this life. Her health is in some ways very good. Her mind is very good. 
her amazing memory is now only like a human memory. It used to be unbelievable. Um, but anyway, it's still pretty good. Um, and her mind is very sharp and her heart is as warm as ever and her wit is as good as ever. Um, she's um, almost blind and she's almost deaf and uh, eating is extremely uncomfortable for her and gives her no pleasure. And she broke her hip and so she can't afford, she's wobbly on her feet and she can't afford to fall again. So she basically, um, you know, she, she needs 24 hour care to prevent her from falling and also to do everything for her. Um, but in another way, her health is good. She's also, by the way, uh, down to, I imagine 75 pounds. She's really all skin and bones, but I was a great joy to see her. Um, anyway, it's a great joy. Can I say it? To be loved by her. Anyway. Um, so, uh, back to Bella Dodd. Okay, so I know this is true because I've looked on the internet and some people are saying eh, they don't want to believe Bella Dodd's story. But I know it's a true story. So here's her story. Now, she was the head of the Communist Party in New York in the 1930s. She was a um, born in Italy and baptized Catholic, but she became a very idealistic young communist, um, I would say, in the 1920s in New York. Her family had moved to New York. And um, she was totally dedicated as a communist, very idealistic. She worked her way up. She became the head of the Communist Party in New York. And, um, and then much later, she was converted back to Catholicism by none less than Archbishop Fulton Sheen. And then when she returned to being a genuine Catholic, she testified to what she had done as a communist in the 1930s, what her assignment, one of her assignments had been. By the way, another one of her assignments was basically to take over the teachers' union, to have the communists totally take over the teachers' union. And you see that today. There is no stronger force for the left wing of the Democrat Party than, um, I forget the acronym for the uh, union of public school teachers. But that, that was her little, one of her little conquests also. That's a big part of her autobiography. Her autobiography is called School of Darkness. And I've read it twice. But I'm not going to talk about her helping the... That was really important, by the way. Because what happened was the communists took over the teachers' union. And the teachers' union is the reason why you have Antifa and Black Lives Matter, basically. Because um, Satan is patient. So he was happy to have the teachers' union taken over in the 1930s, 1940s, so that literally 60 years later, all of the indoctrination in all of the public schools in the country would be the LGBTQ Marxist agenda. Okay, so you've got Bella Dodd to thank for that too, or the communists to thank for that too. But that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about her infiltration of the Catholic Church. So she was given the charter in the 1930s. I'm going to read her words. Maybe I'll pull her up again. I'm going to be reading her. Oh, no. I actually have... Oh, boy. Uh, I, this is a little bit of um, an experiment. I don't know if I'm able to do this. Hold on a second. Oh, here it is. Okay. So I, I will be able to do this. This is her own words when she testified. In the late 20s and 30s, I personally put... 1,100 men into the priesthood in order to weaken the Catholic Church from within. The idea was for these men to be ordained and progress to positions of influence and authority as monsignors and bishops. So here she is in New York City. She's given the job of recruiting young men, placing them in seminaries in order to destroy the Catholic Church from within. So she's recruiting these young men. Now, I ask you, who are the uh, right young men to recruit for this? If you recruit a heterosexual young man, maybe an idealistic communist like Bella Dodd, and he goes to seminary and he becomes a priest and he becomes 26 years old and 30 years old and 35 years old, 
and of course he ha doesn't believe in the Catholic Church and he doesn't believe in God and he doesn't believe in the priesthood. And, you know, he's not the idealistic young communist he was when he was, you know, 21. He's probably going to want to marry and start a family. He's not really good for the long term. But if you recruit a gay 21-year-old or a gay 22-year-old, they're in seventh heaven as a Catholic priest, right? They're not going to want to leave the priesthood. They have, especially in those days, you know, they can run rampant among the altar boys. They can run rampant among the rest of the 1,100 gay priests that she's put in there because they all know each other. They can promote each other's careers. They can cover for each other's sins. You know, it's going to be an incredible embedded cabal if they are all gay. If they're not gay, it's going to fall apart. So I am convinced, Bella Dodd didn't say it explicitly. I am convinced, and Alice von Hildebrand is convinced, and I know this from her lips uh, to my ear, so to speak, that of course Bella Dodd recruited gay men to be this 1,100 young men that she recruited for the Catholic priesthood to, as she put it, progress to positions of influence and authority as monsignors and bishops, and also, if I can say so, vocation directors and uh, seminary rectors and so forth. So let me go on with her text. Of all the world's religion, the Catholic Church was the only one Whoops, okay. Uh, I, I'm not doing, uh, this is a little, techno technology is difficult for me. Of all the world's religion, the tech, Catholic Church was the only one feared by the communists, for it was its only effective opponent. The whole idea was to destroy not the um, institution of the Catholic Church. Oh boy, I think I blew this. Oh, here it is, sorry. The whole uh, idea was to destroy not the institution of the Catholic Church, but rather the faith of the people, and even use the institution of the Church, if possible, to destroy the faith through the promotion of a pseudo-religion. Okay, so this is the explicit communist plot. We saw it was the explicit Masonic plot a few minutes ago, right? The explicit communist plot and Masonic plot were not to destroy the Catholic Church as an institution, but to infiltrate it get control of the levers of power, and turn it into a institution that through what it taught, it would destroy the true faith by promulgating a pseudo-religion, right? In ersatz, counterfeit version of the Catholic faith. A nod is as good as a wink to a blind man, okay? I'll just reread that last paragraph. The whole idea was to destroy not the institution of the church, but to use the institution of the church if possible to destroy the faith through the promotion of a pseudo-religion. Something that resembled Catholicism, but was not the real thing. Once the faith was destroyed, there would be a guilt complex introduced into the church to label the church of the past as being oppressive, authoritarian, full of prejudices, arrogant in claiming to be the sole possessor of the truth, and responsible for the divisions of religious bodies through the centuries. This would be necessary in order to shame church leaders into an openness to the world and to a more flexible attitude towards all religions and philosophies. The communists would then exploit this openness in order to undermine the church. This plan was eventually called Operation Outstretched Hand. More specifically, it was to promote a pseudo-religion, a faith, fake Catholicism, but with enough look and feel to seem real. This plan would then introduce a guilt complex so that the church would apologize for its past activities and then embrace other religions' ideas as a way to get along. Now, this testimony of Bella Dodd 
was from the 1950s. Maybe it was some, whoops, sorry about that, was maybe from 1960. It wasn't from after that. You know, I don't want to say anything that can come back to bite me in the tush. So, you know, <laughs> I don't have to say anything, right? You know, there you have from the Masonic handbook from the middle of the 19th century. There you have from Bella Dodd's instructions from the 1920s from the Communist Party. And then you have your own eyes and ears. You know, I don't have to say anything, okay? Um, I will say one other thing um, that I, only because I heard it from Alice von Hildebrand. So again, this is not hearsay. Uh, well, it is hearsay in a sense, but it's not hearsay if you think she's a credible witness, um, which is that <clears throat> Annabelle Bunini, who was the archbishop who um, how much trouble will I get into? Um, who 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 created the the instruction for the Novus Ordo Mass for the new Mass was exposed as a thirty second degree Mason. Uh, documents were found. It's a long story, um, but. Um, there was a, a priest in Paris who was a uh, fake priest. He was a Mason who was inserted into the priesthood as one of these communist inserted fake priests. Um, but he had a conversion to real Catholicism. He was a Mason. He, he absconded with the list of the, whatever you call it, the baptismal record, so to speak, of Masons, you know, their initiation records from the lodge in Paris. And he uh, smuggled this list, or he conveyed this list, to um, a good guy in the Vatican. Um, he was found with his throat cut from year to year, by the way, about a week later, this, this French priest who did this. Um, however, the uh, person in the Vatican who got this list of uh, Masons went to Pope Paul VI, and uh, said that uh, Bunini is a 32nd degree Mason. Paul VI said, I heard this, well, I'll tell you more about the details of the story. Paul VI said, I don't believe it. I refuse to believe it. It can't be true. This person who conveyed the information, who was in this meeting with Paul VI, said, I'm, I'm sorry, Your Holiness, but if you don't believe it, then the newspapers will have this documentation tomorrow. Paul VI decided to believe it, and he exiled Bunini to Tehran. He made him the uh, papal nuncio or papal legate in Tehran, and he was never allowed back in the Vatican. Bunini, um, and he was he he developed the schema for the um, for the Novus Ordo for the new Mass. So definitely had a Masonic influence. Um, now the person who um, was the channel for most of the really serious research into the Masonic infiltration into the church um, in the 20th century was a French priest named Dom Luigi Villa, who I am very sorry I didn't have a chance to meet because a bunch of friends of mine, he's, he passed away recently, uh, 2007, um, but um, three friends of mine went to see him I, I should have been invited along. I really, I feel like I should have. I feel like they didn't, did me a disservice not inviting me, but they, they actually met with him. Um, and as a matter of fact, one of them got his, his um, files because at that point he was, I don't know how old, but anyway, he knew he was going to die soon. And so he passed on uh, some of his documentation to this one friend of mine. Anyway, there were three attempts on his life. All his teeth were knocked out in one of the attempts. Um, he has a website, he's passed away now, but the website still exists, called chiesaviva.com. I put it up there on the screen. That's his name, Don Luigi Villa. And uh, he published a magazine called Chiesa Viva. Um, he published some books. Um, anyway, heavily documented. 
the Masonic infiltration into the church in the 20th century. So rather than me being accused of um, spreading these stories, if anybody wants to look further, you know, that's a good, that's a good trail to pick up. Um, <clears throat> there's another trail you might pick up, which is the uh, Vatican Bank scandal, um, which is, uh, let me find it here, because um, I'm out of sequence. Um, uh, where, where do I, where did I put that? Boy, I didn't put it anywhere. Okay. Uh, the Vatican bank scandal, uh, actually, if you just Google Vatican, Vatican bank scandal, you'll probably, uh, get on the trail a bit. Um, uh, certainly if you Google, um, Roberto Calvi, uh, here's a picture of him. He's called the Vatican's, he was known as God's banker. He was the head of the Vatican bank. Um, he was the head, uh, was he the head of the Vatican Bank? No, he wasn't the head of the Vatican Bank. I take that back. He was the head of Banco Ambrosiano. Anyway, long story. He was God's banker. He was uh, a banker very connected to the Vatican. And there you see him with Paul VI. Um, he was uh, very heavily involved in some embezzlement of $1.3 billion from the Vatican Bank. Um, and uh, but from the Vatican Bank to um, two people still in the Vatican. Um, there you see how he ended up hanging, uh, originally called a suicide from Blackfriars Bridge. Uh, later, forensic uh, science was able to establish it wasn't a suicide. He had 12 pounds of bricks in his pocket and uh, $13,000 in cash. And it was clearly a um, hit, uh, probably a Masonic hit. And um, there you see his final days, which was quite a way down. So if you look at, if you look up uh, Roberto Calvi, you'll get on a trail of a lot of this stuff. If you look up uh, Archbishop Paul Machinkas, he was involved. Um, he was actually a prisoner of the Vatican also, but for another reason. He was, he was the head of the Vatican Bank when this $1.3 billion uh, went disappearing. And uh, the Italian authorities had an arrest warrant out for him. He wanted for, was wanted for questioning with respect to assassinations, the financing of arms smuggling, the financing of uh, the trafficking in stolen gold and counterfeit currencies in radioactive materials. And he was actually indicted for banking fraud, but he took refuge in the Vatican's where he had to hide for seven years and uh, I don't know the legal situation, but he was eventually allowed to leave the Vatican and make it back to the United States. But he was up to his eyeballs in this stuff. So it's a very famous case. Um, it was uh, the Vatican banking scandal. And um, if you, uh, in, in, I think the name of the book, uh, let's see, what was the name of the book? The name of the book was In God's Name by uh, David Yallop, Y-A-L-L-O-P. So anyway, that's a pretty good book. It has all this stuff. But what's, what, is, what does this have to do with anything? Maybe it has nothing to do with anything, or maybe it is by way of saying that the uh, Masonic infiltration into the church has various um, lines of evidence that has taken place. And one of those lines of evidence is... It certainly looks like this plan to have an ersatz Catholicism promulgated may have taken place. But the other thing is that when you look at the details of the financial scandals and even the assassination scandals that are linked with high Vatican officials, you see a um, Masonic infiltration, basically. You do. And there was a Masonic, uh, this P2 Lodge, that's another thing you can look up had, um, it was actually outlawed by the Italian government. It had high government officials. It had high banking officials in Italy. It had high um, curial officials in Italy. And it seems to have been um, the spider's web that coordinated, oh, high mafia officials, of course, because a lot of this banking scandal had to do with laundering mafia money. Maybe you want to look into this, maybe not. 
But anyway, I wanted to point you in that direction for those few of you who might want to um, look into it. So I got to Belladod. I'm on page three of 14 pages of notes. <laughs> no wonder I'm always here until dark. Um, uh, anyway. So I, I got to Belladod, I, uh, which is good. Um, I, okay, so this was all about Colby, of course. Um, so... And... Um, Oh, by the way, final note, it's still forbidden for Catholics to be Masons. Um, it was repeated in 1980 by the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith that the Church's prohibition against Catholic being na Masons remains unchanged. So if anybody says otherwise, 1980 Declaration of the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith is a place to turn. Okay, so da, 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 da. okay, so Colby enters this battle, but Colby is 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 really smart. You know, you can think of this as a battle of um, the army of Satan against the army of the Church, and you can think of it as you know, am I you know uh, you know good Catholics fighting Masons or communists or something. But that'll present a, actually an incorrect picture because we're not fighting for yards of territory, you know, like World War I where the battles of the trenches, you know, where thousands of men would die battling for three yards or ten yards of territory or the Battle of Iwo Jima where thousands died to get a hill. In Vietnam even, you had the same thing. We're not battling for, for yards of territory. We're battling for human souls. That's the yards of territory. That's, in fact, the entire prize is human souls. That is, you know, the, the, the coins, the chips on the poker table. The only thing being fought for is human souls. And a human soul is a human soul. And a human soul of the commandant of Auschwitz is a human soul that's as valuable as, you know, a Franciscan friar uh, in, in Maximilian Kolbe's uh, friary's soul. So what that means is that no human being is your enemy. Every human being is the territory you're trying to conquer for Christ. Okay, and that is the one of the real central beauties of Maximilian Kolbe, and he knew that. He fought only for human souls. He w exhorted everybody at Auschwitz to pray for the conversion and salvation of their Nazi persecutors. He told his Franciscan friars when the friary still existed in Poland, I haven't even gotten to the friary in Poland yet, to pray for the Nazis that were destroying the friary. When um, um, I'm going to wait and wait until I get back to that theme so that I have my notes in front of me. But that is really, really, really the key. The battle was for every individual human soul, not only including the Nazis and the Masons, but especially the Nazis and the Masons, because they were the souls most at risk. And also because if somebody offends against you and you pray for their conversion, you have a huge additional leverage in your prayer over them. Your prayer has a hundred times as much power if they are people who um, you, I don't know how to put it really, but if they're people who have really, really, really offended against you, you can turn around that debt that they owe you, so to speak, and you can turn it around into prayer for their salvation and it gets multiplied a hundredfold. I didn't do a great job of that, but I, I hope you get the idea. Now, um, let me tell you some uh, the illustration about the one of illustration. 
Okay. Nyapa Kalanov. I haven't gotten to Nyapa Kalanov. I have to get to Nyapa Kalanov before I get to this business. Uh, nine, eight, 1919, Maximilian, Poland, uh, Maximilian Kolbe goes back to Poland. He gets permission to start a um, friary. Um, man, am I way, 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 way out of sequence here. Um, please bear with me a moment and see if I can recover it all. Oh, probably not. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, gosh. Okay, here I am. So anyway, 1919, he's recalled to Poland. Uh, he's very ill. He's ill for the rest of his life. He battled tuberculosis. He had very poor health. But he still, you know, worked 20 hours a day. Um, he became a seminary professor. Um, he started publishing this Night of the Immaculata journal that grew rapidly and it grew so rapidly that he started a friary to basically publish the journal. He called it the City of the Immaculata, excuse me, City of the Immaculata, which is Niepokolanov in Polish. Um, the, the City of the Immaculata, his friary grew to be the largest monastery in the world, 650 Franciscan friars before it was destroyed by the Nazis. And the uh, Night of the Immaculata, his publication, became the largest publication in Europe and perhaps the world with a circulation of 350,000. And this is in 1930. The world was much smaller then. And let me see if I can find the appropriate slides here. And um, here you see a photograph taken at Nyepokolanov of just a few of his friars. He had 650 friars, right? But it's quite an army. And um, um, and um, here is a photograph at the time of Nyepokolanov. I mean, it looks like a large army base, right? It has to be pretty large to have 650 friars. And um, here are the friars hard at work. Uh, Type was set by hand in those days, right? There were no machines for doing it, so they're all busily um, setting type for the publications that came out of there. A lot of publications came out of there. You know, it expanded, um, and uh, but of course, I don't have that slide showing all the publications. And here is a very beautiful picture of Saint Maximilian Kolbe's room in the Epikolonov. It was, of course, a pretty bare cell like all the other monks um, with his uh, table there. And um, uh, I'm not going to spend the time to try to pull up, find the slide of all of the publications, but they ended up publishing a number of publications as well as the Night of the Immaculata. Um, anyway, it became this huge, huge, huge um, Franciscan friary. Uh, I'll go back to that for the moment. And until the Nazis came and they destroyed it. Now, he also, by the way, went to uh, Japan and started a city of the Immaculata in Nagasaki. And I will, let me actually, I'll, I'll go into this digression. Um, first of all, that was miraculous. It was also very successful. Um, he built it on land he was given outside of the city and he was given a mountaintop and he built it on the far side of the mountain, not overlooking Nagasaki, but on the far side of the mountain. And one of his friars said, you know, why on this side, the other side overlooking the town would, you know, would be a much better place placement for the friary. And Maximilian Kolbe's response was, one day you'll know why. Nagasaki, of course, was the atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. Nagasaki went up in a mushroom cloud. The friary and the friars were spared because the mountain itself shielded them from the blast. They were on the far side of the mountain. And Maximilian Kolbe, in, I, it would have been, the 19 late 1920s early 1930s 
knew that, or at least he said to this friar, one day you'll know why I built it on the far side of the mountain. Now, this brings up another point. I do not think it's coincidence that the atomic bomb was built and was dropped on Nagasaki, which was the home of the city of the Immaculata in Japan and the home of this Franciscan friary of holy monks. Uh, and also, by the way, the Catholic center of Japan, which is probably why Maximilian Kolbe put his friary there. Kenosha, Wisconsin. Does that ring a bell? Uh, somebody please send me a, a chat <laughs> about Kenosha, Wisconsin. Kenosha, Wisconsin, of course, is a real hotspot of what's going on right now. Kenosha, Wisconsin was a familiar name to me. Why? It was where the city of the Immaculata was founded in the United States. It was moved from there. It was founded, I believe, in 1948 in Kenosha, Wisconsin. It was moved from there in 1978. Kenosha, Wisconsin became a hot spot of demonic activity, obviously, right now as we're talking. Right? Nagasaki became this incredible explosive point, so to speak, between you know, between, you know, the expression of Satan's fury with the atomic bomb going off there. Um, uh, it's no, I don't think it's any coincidence. But anyway, I, th I thought it was certainly worth mentioning that the city of the Immaculata in Japan was Nagasaki and the city of the Immaculata in the United States was Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, so anyway, everything... All human warfare, well, I shouldn't want to, all human warfare, all, all of the big human warfare, spiritual warfare, having broken through the surface and being acted out by human agents. Speaking of which, another perhaps welcome digression is you, some of you like me getting political, some of you don't, but the demo, the Come on, I mean, you know, we're whatever, 80 days away from, from the election. The 2020 Democratic National Committee presidential party platform. Get it from the DNC site. Look at it. It's unbelievable. It's absolutely unbelievable. Talk about, you know, the army of Satan versus the army of God. Um, let me just pull up a couple of quotes. I'm not making this up. If I am, you'll know I'm a liar in, in 30 seconds because you can pull this stuff up on the internet. This is from the 2020 DNC platform that was passed, what is it, one or two weeks ago? Democrats believe that freedom of religion and the right to believe or not believe are fundamental human rights. Okay, it's an assertion of freedom of religion. You think that's a good thing, right? Then it goes on to say, we will never use protection of that right as a cover for discrimination. So they give with one hand and take back with the other. Because what that, what's that mean? That they'll never use a, cover, uh, a protection, a freedom of religion, as a cover for discrimination? That means that freedom of religion doesn't mean that you can be opposed to abortion on demand. Freedom of religion doesn't mean that you can refuse to contribute to taxes that go to pay for abortion or to an insurance program that goes to pay for abortion or contraception. It doesn't mean that you can have a Catholic school that refuses to hire a teacher because he's a married homosexual, married, excuse me, partnered homosexual. It doesn't mean that you can have a Catholic adoption agency that refuses to place children in uh, same-sex couples uh, who want the child for sexual purposes, quite possibly. It's been known to happen. I'm not making this up. Um, okay, that's in the platform. We will never use protection of freedom of religion as a cover for discrimination. And given the vehemently pro-LGBTQ plus um, position of the platform, that means basically that freedom of religion doesn't apply to the Catholic Church. Look, I mean, in, in Canada, or certainly Norway, reading the scripture verses that prohibit sodomy 
is a jail sentence. A, a Protestant pastor was jailed for reading them. In Canada, reading them is against the law. Do you think that freedom of religion as defined by this 2020 platform will allow those passages to be read by a Catholic priest from a Catholic pulpit? You're dreaming. Anyway, uh, going on from the uh, presidential platform, we will work to ensure that LGBTQ plus people are not discriminated against when seeking to adopt or foster children. There you have it for adoption. Um, and guarantee transgender students access to facilities based on their gender identity, meaning good luck. 14 year old girls at a Catholic high school and not having 16 year old boys showering with you in your girls locker room because they're self identifying as I don't even know what the right word is as transgender. And finally, Democrats will ban harmful conversion therapy practices. Okay, so basically any psychotherapy, any psychological counseling that will help a confused 12 or 13 year old sort out his or her gender identity is illegal. Now this is, granted, this is already implicitly practiced in, in left-wing states in the United States. Uh, I know that in Massachusetts, I have dear friends whose adolescent daughter, I think about 14 years old, at last I heard was being taken away from them because they're Catholic and she identifies as transgendered. Um, but this is making it an official party platform for the whole country, okay? So, so, once upon a time, once upon a time, you know, the, the two major political parties in this country were, you know, had various agendas, you know, some good, some bad in both parties. Um, how you cannot see Satan in control of the primary thrusts of one of those two parties now, I don't know if YouTube's going to take down this video or not. Um, it, it escapes me. I mean, really, read the platform, make up your own mind. If you're in favor of what the platform is in favor of, then by all means, <laughs> vote for vote for the candidate of that platform, even if you can't remember his wife's name or who's his sister and who's his wife. <laughs> anyway, never mind. At least I'm not mentioning that name of that forbidden drug, you know, which I know gets you pulled off uh, YouTube. Anyway, okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Back to Colby. Okay, so he had started Nyapakolonov. I'll get to the end of his biography now. Um, Nyapakolonov was destroyed by the Germans. He ended up being sent to Auschwitz. And he ended up at Auschwitz giving his life for a stranger, for another inmate. Um, who was married, um, and and Colby volunteered to take his place in the starvation bunker. I think you all know the story. And um, when the Germans came and destroyed Nyepakolonov, that beautiful big mon friary that uh, Colby had poured his heart and soul into, and 650 friars had been working diligently there, what did Colby say when he saw the ruins there? He said, the Immaculata has given all. She has taken it all away. She knows how things are. This wouldn't have happened if it wasn't the Immaculata's will. Talk about walk the walk. And um, when a German commandant came to Nyepakolonov, this is, you know, before Colby was finally taken away, and Colby showed him around the, the ruins. This had to do with negotiating about being allowed to stay there, I believe, if I remember the story right. Colby hosted the German commander who was behind the destruction of Nyek Kalanov with so much gentility and love as though he was his best friend 
that the German commander insisted on a photograph being taken of them. I don't remember that literally they had their arms around each other, probably not. But the German commander wanted a photograph taken of him with his good friend Maximilian Kolbe. Kolbe responded to him with so much love and warmth, even though he was dest had destroyed Nyepakalanov and was, you know, about to send Kolbe to the concentration camp. Talk about love your enemies, okay? Now, um, and finally, I'm going to finish the biography part. Um, when Kolbe was canonized, uh, John Paul II invented a new category of martyr, which is martyr of love. He wasn't, strictly speaking, martyred for the faith. In other words, he wasn't martyred because he identified as a Catholic. That certainly didn't help things any. But he, was, he chose to be martyred out of love for a stranger. So he, uh, a new category was created by John Paul II, a martyr of love. Okay, it's getting dark in here. <laughs> so I'm going to have to turn on the light soon, which is going to really mess up the lighting in here. Um, okay, so on to Colby's spirituality, finally. How long have I been going? An hour and a half. Um, you know what? I am going to take a five minute break like I sometimes do. Okay. So that, um, so that I can rest my voice a little bit, maybe so that I can change the lighting in here a little bit. And, um, maybe so that you guys can, <laughs> can get a cold beer. As you know, I can't have one while I do the shows, but I can have an iced coffee. Maybe I'll get another iced coffee. And, um, yeah, where is Roy? It has to do with um, shadow, actually, and, and sunlight and shadow. This room is lit by sunlight, and um, the sun has gone far enough to the west so that no sunlight is coming in anymore. I'm uh, where am I? I just undisclosed location <laughs> because the Masons might be out for me. But I'm I'm anyway. I'm in an undisclosed location, but it's uh, not all that. It's in the Eastern Time Zone. That's for sure. So anyway, with that, let me switch to a, um, I'll be back in a few moments screen and I'll be back in a few moments. I'll be back at the top of the hour in four minutes with any luck. So hang in there. Um, so here we go.
Okay, I'm back. Thanks for hanging in there. You can see what I mean about messing up the light because now I have all this light coming in from that side, but there's nothing I could do about that. So, um, and I saw the comment about um, first of all, I saw the comment about when are we going to get to Colby's life? Mm -hmm. Which is a very good point. But the answer is we're not going to get a Colby's life because I had a choice in this show to make it about his life or to make it more about his spirituality and the purpose of his life, so to speak. And um, so I chose the latter. I have done other shows. They're audio only on his life itself. There are quite a few from the Radio Maria series that I have on my website. Um, so anyway, and also they're very good books. Let me take a little commercial inter, you know, interruption. Um, not for me. Um, this is a very good book. It's called Colby Saint. Oh, let me get it in front of the camera, right? Saint of the Immaculata, edited by uh, Brother Francis Mary Calvillich. I actually worked on this book. I have a chapter in there. Um, anyway, that has a very good... Uh, it's got other things also that are very good. You know, it's not just his life. It's got chapters on his spirituality, chapter that I wrote on his relation with the Jews and so forth. Um, but anyway, Colby, Saint of the Immaculata. The author's name is Calvillage, K-A-L-V-E-L-A-G-E. -E. He was very instrumental in my vocation. Uh, he, he actually, long story, but anyway, he was a Franciscan monk at the City of the Immaculate in the United States on Marytown. Uh, and he was the editor of the Marytown um, Night of the Immaculate or whatever they call their journal. And this book I really, really like. It's called A Man for Others. And it is, what's the subtitle? The Saint of Auschwitz in the Words of Those Who Knew Him. So it's very valuable because it's got a lot of um, quotes and descriptions and events, anecdotes from the people of those anecdotes, people who knew him in Auschwitz, people who knew him in the Friary, people who knew him in Japan, and so forth. Um, so anyway, so I guess what I'm saying is you don't need me for the life of Colby. Maybe you don't need me at all, but you know what I mean. It's, it's biography. So, okay, and the other comment, uh, yeah, there, the... Um, I'll go back to that a little bit about this this war between the army of Satan and the army of God. I saw some comments there about, you know, bad things that Trump said, in, supposedly insulting a disabled person or whatever. And, you know, the truth is you, you, can't, you can't believe anything that's coming from the mainstream media. It's never been like this before, but you can't believe anything having to do with Trump coming from the mainstream media. Uh, it's just too, too much the agent of the uh, DNC and the agent of the forces. See, I, I see there was a comment by, uh, by somebody who isn't a U.S. resident there about this coming election. The truth is, I said this before, but Tr Trump is actually, <laughs> he's defending the free world against Satan right now. I mean, he is, he is the you know, little Dutch boy with his thumb in the dike. Um, you know, he may not be much of a saint, so to speak, but his role right now is, you know, après moi le déluge, after me the flood. Really, really, the, the flood. There's nothing else holding back this flood. The flood of Red China, the flood of um, Marxism taking over the United States implicitly or explicitly. The, the flood of the LGBTQ plus um, ideology, the, the, the criminalization of Christianity and the Catholic Church. 
you know, like him or not, you know, he's the one holding that stuff back right now. And since the media, the mass media, are entirely in the camp of the guy who pays cash on the barrel head, you know, with lust and fame and money, it, it's, it's totally been taken over. So I think you guys all knew that already thought that way. Oh, gosh, my goodness. Um, you're going to have to forgive me because I, I forgot to light the candle. So, um, oh, boy. Maybe I'll be reading by this candle the way things are going right now. I need all the help I can get, so there we go. And um, just for fun, let me put this someplace where you actually might be able to see it. If you have... Yeah, anyway, it's a... Maybe you'll be able to see it, maybe not. It's a little in-joke. Um, <laughs> I don't want to get in too much trouble. Uh, okay, back to Colby. And Colby, please pray for us, because we really need you these days. Okay. Um, so, when Nyepa Kalanov was destroyed, the, the theme, okay, what am I talking about now? I'm talking about Colby's, the heart of his spirituality of, when Nyepa Kalanov was destroyed, the, the theme, okay, what am I talking about now? I'm talking about Colby's, the heart of his spirituality of fighting to the death for the salvation, for the conversion of every human soul, for the salvation of every human soul. I don't want to say just salvation without saying conversion, because that is one of the problems of this false Catholicism that we have now. Souls are only saved if they convert, okay? God wants all men to be saved. That's, uh, I have it somewhere, <laughs> the quote. John, oh, anyway, I don't have it, but God wills that all men be saved. Definitely there in, in, the, in the epistles. God wills that all men to be saved. Um, he doesn't want anyone to go to hell. However, you have to sign up. You have to want to be saved. You have to sign up with God. If you have signed up with Satan, and if you do not turn around, that is convert, God will not save you against your will. Therefore, it actually, to pray for someone's salvation, if they're on the road to hell, is tantamount to praying for their conversion, because they're not going to be saved if they don't convert. Okay? Not, all men are not saved, and we dare not hope in the sense of have a reasonable expectation that all men will ever be saved. And we know that we can certainly hope that any given individual be saved. And I'm going to tell a very beautiful story. Did you know that the Commandant of Auschwitz was saved? I'll get to that in a moment. I'm just giving the Colby and background to that. The Commandant of Auschwitz, who was executed, who was hung by, uh, you know, after the Nuremberg trials, he had a conversion before his death and he had the sacraments and he had a very heartfelt conversion and there is zero doubt in my mind that the grace version of the commandant of Auschwitz was would not have happened if Maximilian Kolbe had not been there you know that it came through the prayer of Max and the sacrifice of Maximilian Kolbe because Maximilian Kolbe at Auschwitz what was he giving his suffering up for what you know what what was he offering up his suffering for he was offering up his suffering for the conversion of the Nazis. Okay? So that's what it means to hope that all men be saved. It doesn't mean that we can just, you know, in this kind of Pollyanna-ish view, say, well, God is so full of mercy that, oh, certainly in the long run, no one will ever go to hell. And you know who said that? We know that from Jesus. First of all, just... Just go through the Gospel of Matthew in particular and see how many times Jesus talks about um, the wailing and gnashing of teeth and the flame, you know, the worm that dieth not and the flame that is not extinguished and stuff. And he, we, we also know straight from Jesus that, um, unfortunately, Judas ended up in hell. And I'll just read two, two short citations, lest any of you be led us by what some people are calling the church of nice, you know, that, you know, that there are no high stakes to this, 
business of life on earth. Matthew 26, Last Supper. And as they were eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He, uh, Jesus answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Jesus, who betrayed him, said, Is it I, Master? Jesus replied, You have said so. Okay? And then in John 17, Jesus said, None of them, none of those who you have given me is lost except the son of perdition. Okay? So the son of perdition was Jesus was Judas, excuse me. Ju Judas was lost. There's only one way to be lost. Purgatory is not being lost. Heaven is not being lost. And at the Last Supper, Jesus said, it would be better for that man, clearly Jesus, excuse me, clearly Judas, it would have been better for Judas if he had not been born. Newsflash, if you end up in purgatory, you're better off than if you had not been born. If you end up in heaven, better than not being born. The only situation in which it's not better, um, it would not have been better to not have been born if, it is, if you are lost, if you end up in hell. So I would argue that we know straight from the mouth of Jesus in scripture that, G that Judas is in hell. Anyway, so note that Maximilian Kolbe was, yes, he was praying for the salvation of the Nazis. He was praying for their conversion because that's where salvation comes from. It comes from conversion. It doesn't come from being saved you know, against, excuse me, against your will. Okay, each soul is the prize. Each soul, including the souls of those who are the enemies of God. They are, in a sense, particularly valuable prizes, and is those for whom Maximilian Kolbe, to a large extent, gave his life. Um, now, Nyepakalanov was destroyed, as I mentioned. It was destroyed when somebody denounced it to the Nazis. So somebody reported to the Nazis that in their publications they were uh, implicitly criticizing the Third Reich. And in retaliation, the Nazis destroyed Nyepakalanov, the, the friary. Um, somebody, uh, when somebody denounced Nyepakalanov to the Nazis resulting in its destruction, Colby's response was, quote, and this is from a man for others. This is from someone who is there. Quote, I don't care about the friary as long as that soul is saved. He didn't care about his friary of 650 friars being raised to the ground and the statues of the Blessed Virgin Mary being smashed and his printing presses being smashed and everything. As long as the soul of the person who denounced it to the Nazis is saved. OK. Um, again, a quote of Colby's in suffering and persecution, we reach a high degree of sanctity. And at the same time, we bring our persecutors to God. OK, when he was being beaten to a pulp by a sadistic guard at Auschwitz, he was offering that that suffering for the salvation of that guard and the other guards. It's dead certain. It's dead certain. In Auschwitz, Colby told his friend John Lipsky, and Lipsky's account is in A Man for Others, quote, no one's conversion possible, and urged him to pray for the Nazis. Note that. No one's conversion is impossible. He didn't say no one's salvation is impossible. I'm sorry. But, you know, we have some rather prominent bishops around who think that people's salvation is possible, perhaps, without their conversion. But in any case, no one's conversion is impossible. Pray for their conversion. From their conversion comes, sal from, from their conversion comes salvation. Okay. God will not override our free will to reject him. That's why the conversion is necessary. 
Uh, I see I have a very literate um, chat stream here. Yes, Rudolf Hus, the commandant of Auschwitz, repented, went to confession and had last rites before he was hanged. By the way, the priest who heard his confession and gave him last rites was a priest who had been uh, persecuted. He was a Jesuit. He had been persecuted by the Nazis. And uh, I forgot the exact story, but he he had the right to have a personal grudge. But he didn't. Anyway, uh, and then um, another person who survived Auschwitz, uh, who had who slept, he actually slept next to Colby in in the in the I don't want to call it barracks. I guess you have to call it barracks, but slept next to Colby, uh, Henry Sienkiewicz. Uh, he's he said this, quote, Colby would have liked to convert the entire camp, including the Nazis. Not only did he pray for them, but he exhorted us to pray for their conversion. Okay, so he's running around Auschwitz, not only praying for the guards and all the Nazis, but he's beating every other Auschwitz prisoner over the head, urging them, not literally beating them over the head, there were others to do that, uh, urging them to pray for their persecutors. Okay, and again, note that he did not pray for their salvation, but their conversion. Now, Rudolf Hoess, whom one of you mentioned, um, he was the commandant of Auschwitz. I have lots of pictures of Hoess. Um, <laughs> pictures of Nazis are very internet. Now, first of all, this, this was, a, needless to say, a really bad guy um, prior to his conversion, let's say. Um, here's a picture of him in his heyday, so to speak. There is him, looks like he's smoking a cigar, or maybe it's a cigarette, uh, in a very joyful mood. There's Mengele next to him, and uh, the other officer's name is Bear. I don't know what he's famous for. Mengele, of course, you know, making lampshades out of the skin of Jews and doing all of these uh, incredible tortures, pseudo-medical experiments on inmates at Auschwitz. And Rudolf Hurs, the commandant. Now, Rudolf Hurs. Um, in, uh, in May of 1944, he arranged, he supervised an operation which was called Operation Hurs, in which 430,000 Hungarian Jews, 430,000 Hungarian Jews were transported to Auschwitz and killed in 56 days. That means almost 10,000, probably 9,000 on average Jews a day being killed. That was a big number, and it was hard to deal with that number of corpses. So all they could do was uh, burn them in giant pits. And here you have um, a pit at Auschwitz stacked with corpses. And um, <clears throat> as I said, 10,000 a day, 430,000 was Operation Hurst, was his own baby. And of course, I think he said at Nuremberg Trials that he estimated between two and a half million and three and a half million um, uh, inmates of Auschwitz were executed under his watch. And um, however, he was arrested. Um, he tried to, oh, oh, by the way, here's him with his family as a commandant at Auschwitz, uh, two little boys and three little girls. And the uh, he was a... Um, weekly communicant. Supposedly every Sunday he proudly traipsed off his, you know, his beautiful little blonde haired troop to mass for Sunday mass. He thought he was a good Catholic and a good Nazi. <laughs> Am I allowed to say, it makes me think of people who think they're a good Catholic and a good Democrat. Am I allowed to say that? Anyway, I don't mind losing. One of the nice things about doing the show for free is I don't mind losing customers. <laughs> so anyway. So anyway, so there he was as commandant of Auschwitz. And um, he, he uh, came, he did a good job trying to escape, but he was caught. And there he is caught. He certainly looks less full of himself than when he was commandant of Auschwitz. And um, here he is. He was convicted at Nuremberg. A conviction which he welcomed, by the way. He, he had a conversion while waiting his 
um, trial and execution at Nuremberg. Um, and here he is being taken to the gallows. You see the executioner with the traditional black hood. And um, uh, here, uh, let me see what I have here because I, I want to be careful not to, um, I want to be careful not to show uh, the, the more gruesome picture of him uh, having been hung. Anyway, there he is being taken to the gallows. There he is um, uh, being set up for the hanging. You can see the noose there next to his head and the executioner positioning the stool under him. And here you see the last picture I'm going to show because it is before the hanging itself, I believe. I'm sure it's before the hanging. And there you see the Catholic priest um, doing whatever last prayers he's doing before the hanging. And as I said, he had a conversion while he was in prison, awaiting his certain hanging. And uh, here, let me find, um, let me, here. Um, let, let me, here I have uh, this text up on a slide, so I'll pull this up. No, I'll just leave that slide up there and read the text. My conscience compels me to make the following declaration. In the solitude of my prison cell, I have come to the bitter recognition that I have sinned gravely against humanity. As Commandant of Auschwitz, I was responsible for carrying out part of the cruel plans of the Third Reich for human destruction. In so doing, I have inflicted terrible wounds on humanity. I cause unspeakable suffering for the Polish people in particular. I am to pay for this with my life. May the Lord God forgive one day what I have done. I ask the Polish people for forgiveness. Let me see. Excuse me. Okay, now this says I've been reconnected. Uh, bear with me one moment. Um, while I see what's going on. Okay. Okay, I, I think I am reconnected. I apologize for that. I have the world's worst internet connection here and I can't get Com Comcast to do anything about it. Uh, water has penetrated the cable outside. Um, now, this is the letter he wrote to his children. Based on my present knowledge, I can see today clearly, severely, and bitterly for me that the entire ideology about the world in which I believe so firmly and... Uh, oh, I read that. I'm sorry. This is the letter he wrote to his children. Keep your good heart. Become a person who lets himself be guided primarily by warmth and humanity. Learn to think and judge for yourself responsibly. Don't accept everything without criticism and as absolutely true. The biggest mistake of my life was that I believed everything faithfully which came from the top, and I didn't dare to have the least bit of doubt about the truth of that which was presented to me. In all your undertakings, don't just let your mind speak, but listen above all to the voice in your heart. So I don't think there can be a doubt that this was a um, genuine, earnest um, conversion. And um, that is, that is, um, uh, I don't know how to say this. I just say the same thing over and over again. But that, that is the point of um, this Maximilian Colby, Colbyan spirituality of praying for the conversion of one's persecutors. Now, I am um, going to go on to the central component of Maximilian spirituality. <clears throat> 
which was, of course, the intensity of his Marian devotion. Whew. Okay. So, I'll begin there where I ended, which was kind of at Auschwitz. <clears throat> because when Maximilian Kolbe was taken away from Nyepakolonov to Auschwitz, he was actually sitting at his desk writing his last work, which was a um, on the Immaculate Conception. And um, just as he like wrote the last word down, they came and took him away. So let me read from that last work on the Immaculate Conception. Now, remember, I started the show saying, <clears throat> excuse me, that Colby was totally focused on Mary when she appeared to Bernadette's Immaculate Conception. She didn't say, I am the mother of God. She didn't say, I am the Blessed Virgin Mary. She didn't say, I was immaculately conceived. She said, I am the Immaculate Conception. So he, he spent his life meditating on why did she say, I am the Immaculate Conception. And that's what he was wrote uh, was writing about uh, in his very last writing. Immaculate Conception. These words fell from the lips of the Immaculata herself. Hence, they must tell us in the most precise and an, an essential manner who she really is. The Father begets the Son. The Spirit proceeds from Father and Son. And who is the Holy Spirit? The flowering of the love between the Father and the Son. If the fruit of created love is a created conception, then the fruit of divine love, that prototype of all created love, is necessarily a divine conception. The Holy Spirit is therefore the uncreated eternal conception, the prototype of all the conceptions that multiply life throughout the whole universe. The Spirit is then this thrice, thrice holy conception, this infinitely holy, uncreated, immaculate conception. United to the Holy Spirit as his spouse, the Blessed Virgin Mary is one with God in an incomparably more perfect way than can be said of any other creature. What sort of union is this? It is above all an interior union, a union of her essence, with the essence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in her, lives in her. This was true from the first instant of her existence. It was always true. It will always be true. In the Holy Spirit's union with Mary, we observe more than the love of two beings. In one, there is all the love of the Blessed Trinity. In the other, all of creation's love. So it is that in this union, heaven and earth are joined, all of heaven with all of earth, the totality of eternal love with the totality of created love. It is truly the summit of love. At Lourdes, the Immaculata did not say of herself that she had been conceived immaculately, but as St. Bernadette repeated it, I am the Immaculate Conception. If among human beings the wife takes the name of her husband because she belongs to him, is one with him, becomes equal to him, and is with him the source of new life, with how much greater reason should the name of the Holy Spirit, who is the divine immaculate conception, be used as a name of her in whom he lives as uncreated love, the principle of life in the whole supernatural order of grace. So I'm just going to point out two things in this passage. Um, the first is that Colby is pointing out the following, that the Holy Spirit is the uncreated immaculate conception. The Holy Spirit flows from the love between the Father and the Son, and therefore is the, and love alone creates, that's the subtitle of the show, love alone creates, you know, was a really big, I mean, it was like the motto of Maximilian Kolbe. He loved his persecutors um, only, in, only in love. 
is their creation. Love is at the heart of creation. God is at the heart of creation. God created all that exists. God is love. Everything that's created is, 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 uh, is a fruit of love, is created through love. And that's why, in fact, human conceptions, human beings are created f through the love. I know this isn't always the case, but the system is that they're created through the love of the spouses, their parents, and the uh, so the human conceptions, who are not immaculate, of course, because they're conceived with original sin, are the fruit of love, and the original, uncreated, immaculate conception is the Holy Spirit, which is the fruit of the love between the Father and the Son. Now, if the Holy Spirit is the original, uncreated, immaculate conception, the Blessed Virgin Mary is the created immaculate conception. And if a, a human spouse, a human wife, takes the name of her husband when she marries him, since the Holy Spirit is the original immaculate conception, the Blessed Virgin Mary, as the spouse of the original immaculate conception, identified herself with her husband's name as the immaculate conception although she's the created Immaculate Conception. She's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. She was the spouse of the Holy Spirit from the moment she said yes, and the Holy Spirit overshadowed her, and she conceived in her womb, and conceived Jesus in her womb. Conception comes about through the spousal act of spouses, okay? The overshadowing of the Holy Spirit of the Blessed Virgin Mary was the spousal act. That's how the conception of Jesus took place. It was purely spiritual spousal act, of course. But the conception is the fruit of the spousal act. They were made spouses at that very moment, and they are spouses for all eternity. For all eternity, the Blessed Virgin Mary isn't only the mother of God. She's the wife of God. She's the spouse of God, okay? She's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. As she said, thank God to me, when she appeared to me, you know that story, I am the beloved daughter of the Father, mother of the Son, and spouse of the Spirit. For all eternity, she's going to be the mother of God, and for all eternity, she's going to be the spouse of God. Okay, I'll just go on from there. Now, we know that the Blessed Virgin Mary is the mediatrix of all grace. We know that dogmatically, even though it hasn't been formally pronounced in a dogmatic statement in, as a, I don't know what the right word is, but as a official pronouncement. We know it from other uh, magisterial statements. And I'll just give a few statements of popes and saints. Make it perfectly clear. Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, God has willed that we should have nothing which does not pass through the hands of Mary. Saint Alphonsus Liguori, God, who gave us Jesus Christ, wills that all graces that have been, that are, and that will be dispensed to men until the end of the world, through the merits of Jesus Christ, should be dispensed by the hands and through the intercession of Mary. Now, um, you remember the, uh, uh, where do I have that slide? You remember the uh, picture of, our, of the, uh, the Madonna of the Miracle from the Miraculous Medal. That's what her fingers, that's what's coming from her fingers, is the graces that she is dispensing that were earned by Jesus, but that uh, she is dispensing that are flowing through her. Um, let me, uh, let me pull, pull up the Miraculous Medal picture. Here is the image as it is on the Miraculous Medal. Now you see all of those rays. They're flowing to mankind through the hands of Mary. She's dispensing them, as St. Uh, Alphonsus Liguori said. Um, they're flowing to her fingers. And when St. Catherine Labore saw this um, image, she asked the Blessed Virgin Mary, what about the rings that are dark? Because there were some rings from which no rays were flowing. 
And the Blessed Virgin Mary's reply was, those are graces for which no one is asking. So this entire image of the Madonna of the Miracle, which was the center of, um, of course, I am the Immaculata is from this image, was the center of Colby's spirituality is intimately related with her being the mediatrix of all graces. So um, where, I don't know where I was in, in terms of showing pictures. So I guess I'll just go back to reading here. Um, continuing, it's Pope Benedict XIV, the Blessed Virgin Mary is like a celestial stream through which the flow of all graces and gifts reach the soul of all wretched mortals. Pope Pius IX, for God has committed to the of all good things in order that everyone may know that through her obtained every hope, every grace, and all salvation. Pope Leo XIII, nothing of all of the immense treasury of every grace which the Lord has accumulated is imparted to us except through Mary. So, we know clearly that the Blessed Virgin Mary is the mediatrix of all graces. She is the conduit through which all of the graces that flow from divinity into humanity flow. Now, the normal way of thinking of Catholics is to think that this is the case um, because she is the mother of God, that this, this um, privilege is given to her by virtue of her being the mother of God. St. Maximilian Kolbe presented the premise, the theory, that one could equally well see that this prerogative belongs to her as the spouse of God, as the spouse of the Holy Spirit. And that is, in fact, why she is the mediatrix of all graces. Let me now read some uh, passages from St. Maximilian Kolbe that support that uh, assertion. The third person of the most blessed Trinity never took flesh. Still, our human word spouse is far too weak to express the reality of the relationship between the Immaculata and the Holy Spirit. We can affirm that she is, in a certain sense, the incarnation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in Mary after the fashion, one might say, in which the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the Word, is in his humanity. There is, of course, this difference. In Jesus there are two natures, divine and human, but one single person who is God. Mary's nature and person are totally the nature and person of the Holy Spirit. Still, their union is so inexpressible and so perfect that the Holy Spirit acts only by the Immaculata, his spouse. This is why she is the mediatrix of all graces given by the Holy Spirit. Um, let me explain this a little bit and justify this a little bit. First of all, Maximilian Kolbe elsewhere used the term quasi-incarnation. Jesus Christ the, um, is true God and true man in a single person. Two natures in one person. He is a true incarnation of God as man. The Blessed Virgin Mary is not a true incarnation of the Holy Spirit because she is two persons. I rather, Excuse me, they are two persons. She is one person. The Holy Spirit is one person. Between them, they're two persons. They are two natures, a divine nature and a human nature that are still in two persons, a divine person and a human person. However, that divine person and that human person have been united in holy matrimony. They are united in a spousal union. The spousal union is the most intimate and complete union that is possible between two persons. So they are two persons, but they are united 
in a uniquely intimate union, the spousal union. So although it's not an incarnation, it's as close as you could get to two persons becoming one flesh, let's say, right? That's what God says, that husband and wife shall become one flesh, okay? Two persons, but one flesh. But so St. Maximilian Kolbe is pointing out that in this uniquely intimate and complete union between the Holy Spirit and the Blessed Virgin Mary, i.e. the spousal union, the union of man and wife, the two natures, the divine nature of the Holy Spirit and the human nature of Mary, are united more closely than one could ever imagine those a human nature and a divine nature being united, with the exception of the true incarnation in Jesus. I don't think you can quibble with this, actually, but, you know, it just, it just seems logical. So, um, anyway, that's what he's saying. And um, he says elsewhere, the Blessed Virgin Mary is united to the Holy Spirit so closely that we cannot really grasp this union. But we can at least say that the Holy Spirit and Mary are two persons who live in such intimate union that they have but one soul life. They are the ideal <laughs> married couple. They are the platonic ideal, if you excuse the mixed metaphor the theoretical ideal of a, of a marital union. They have but one soul life. Um, they have but one will. I don't want to get in theological. I, I, I take that back. I'll, I'll say it another way. The Blessed Virgin Mary's will is more perfectly united with the will of God than is true of any other creature. Period. End of paragraph. The Blessed Virgin Mary's will is perfectly united with the will of God, always has been, always will be. That's why Maximilian Kolbe could say um, this wouldn't have happened when Nyapakalanov was destroyed. This wouldn't have happened if it wasn't the will of the Immaculata. That's not because providence is an expression of her will. It's that Providence is a expression of God's will, and the Blessed Virgin Mary's will is entirely congruent with God's will, matches God's will perfectly. Um, so, I, my intention is to is to stop at uh, six o'clock our time. In other words, uh, after three hours. So, oh, okay. I see this. The chats are are now more. Um, I don't know how to put it, but nothing, nothing directly related, um, which is fine. It's fine. I just love the fact that there's a little community of chats there. Okay, so I'm going to read a series of quotes of uh, Maximilian Kolbe. Um, uh, yeah, and I will finish with reading his consecration. And I will finish by six if I'm obedient. The Immaculata is the summit of perfection of a creature. The Mother of God is the most godlike of creatures. The purpose of the creature, the purpose of man, is the progressive growth and likeness to the Creator, a constantly more perfect godliness. God becomes man so that man can become God, as St. Augustine said. We imitate good, virtuous, holy people, but none of these is without imperfection. Only she, immaculate from the first moment of her existence, knows no fault. It is she whom one should emulate and come close to. We should become hers, become her. Behold the peak of perfection. Okay? It's really true. It's daunting, but true. Our purpose is the progressive growth of likeness to the Creator to become more and more like God. Of creatures, she is the one most conformed to God. She is the most perfect of creatures. So if we want to become most perfectly conformed to God, if we want to come as close to being the most perfect of creatures, we will try to become as close as possible to being like the Blessed Virgin Mary. 
Now I know you could say the same with respect to Jesus, and it's true with respect to Jesus, because of course, Jesus laid down his life for his fellow men, and Maximilian Kolbe, of course, was um, coming as close to that as anyone could ever come, laying down his life for a stranger. Um, so he was certainly conformed to Jesus. Maximilian Kolbe, and uh, by the way, Louis de Montfort, um, who is you know the other primary consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary Saint, both thought, claimed, that somehow conforming oneself to the Blessed Virgin Mary was an easier way of conforming oneself to Jesus. I can't justify that. I, but it's found in their writings that uh, Louis de Montfort said that, um, that essentially conforming yourself to Jesus you know, it's like a piece of marble being, you know, like chiseled into the image of Jesus. But putting yourself entirely in the hands of the blessed, like a piece of, of, of plaster, putting itself in a mold to be molded into the image of Jesus, which is, of course, much faster and less painful than being chiseled. That was his metaphor. And I think you find that in Maximilian Colby, too, essentially, that that the easiest and surest way of being made to conform to Jesus is, look, Jesus was formed in the womb of Mary. So let her be the mold in which we're reformed into the image of Jesus. So anyway, okay, back. Um, the, uh, these are more quotes of Maximilian Kolbe. Human words do not have the power to relate who she is, the true mother of God. In reality, she is only a creature, but she is such a sublime being made by God that one would have to grasp in order to understand who the mother of God is. That's a really neat thought. So sublime in her resemblance to God to, and in her being the mother of God and the spouse of God that one would have to understand who God is in order to understand who the Blessed Virgin Mary is. That's certainly a, a thought worth pondering. And I'm reconnected. Okay, so now I'm supposed to be reconnected. Am I reconnected? Uh, okay. What I did not point out earlier is that the Holy Spirit says is coming from the Holy Spirit is coming from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. We all know about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We all know about the fruits of the Holy Spirit. The gifts that God Oh boy. Okay, wait 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 be patient. Be patient. I want to see our hearts and we belong to her unreservedly. This is our ideal. That her life might grow deeper in us from day to day, from hour to hour, from meal. It is our ideal to win the whole world for the Immaculata and through her hands, the souls who are and who will be, all of them collectively and each of them individually. How soon and how completely will we defeat the evil in the whole world when we allow ourselves to be guided by her completely? This is our most important and our only business. Wow, I read that too fast. How soon and how completely? Well, I want to close by six, as I said. Um, I will um, close. This song, I mean, yes. This, I, it's painful not to go on and on and on, Colby. All I can do in even in a three hour show is um, I can't tell. Am I lost again to you guys? Uh, boy. Okay. Um, 
I have um, good news for you. I don't know if any of you can hear me, but I have. I am at the same time recording this, and so I will put up the recording of this. Um, so anyway, I'm sorry. I don't know if any of you are here. I'm going to close with the um, act of consecration of Maximilian Kolb. O Immaculata, Queen of and our most loving mother, I, Roy Showman, a repentant sinner, cast myself at your feet, humbly imploring you to take have wholly to yourself as your possession and property. Please make of me, of all my powers of soul and body, of my whole life, death and eternity, whatever most pleases you. If it pleases you, use all that I am and have without reserve, wholly to accomplish what was said of you. She will crush your head, and you alone have destroyed all hair. Be a fit instrument in your immaculate and merciful hands for introducing and increasing your glory to the maximum in all the strayed and indifferent souls and thus help extend as far as possible the blessed kingdom of the most sacred heart of Jesus. For where is conversion and growth in holiness, since it is through your hands that all graces come to us from the most sacred heart of Jesus. Allow me to praise you, O most sacred virgin. Give me strength again, men. Thank you for watching, if any of you are still able to watch. And um, I, I will be back. I won't wait two weeks this time. It'll probably be next Sunday. And um, maybe, maybe even before then, but maybe not. Sunday seems to be a good rhythm. Anyway, I'm babbling because I hate to say goodbye. So goodbye for now. And remember, if you suffered from that internet problem, is there